Namaskar. Welcome to ep episode 11 of Ask Abhijit. And because there is an appointment that Abhijit has in 45 minutes, we are going to jump straight into questions today. Abhijit, welcome to P Guru's channel. Well, well, very well. Thanks for having me on. Well, well, very well, very well, very well. I am pulling up the questions here as we speak. So let's jump right into the questions. Chetan Kumar wants to know, in 2009, there were a series of attacks and killings of Indian students in Australia. My relatives in Australia told me the Indian media beefed up the matter. What was your observation then, 2009? Yeah, I was also in Australia at that time. And you know, uh, one, two of those attacks were on Indians. Uh, it, it turned out most of the other attacks were Indians on Indians. Uh, the last one, which was the actual white person on Indian attack, was a copycat attack because uh, so much had been spread. Another one was a husband and wife running a uh, uh, insurance racket and they set their own car on fire to get insurance and they're serving jail time for it or they served jail time for it. I don't think they give you 10 years for uh, insurance fraud out there. Uh, so, you know, Australia is probably one of the least racist countries I've ever visited. I lived there for 12 years and I can tell you, I never, not once, faced racism. Uh, not that, you know, my experience is the experience. The thing about Australia is if you think you're too smart by half or too big for anybody, if you have, you know, attitude issues, it's a very brutal society. They'll bring you down to earth because you know, it's one of the few countries where you can walk into a bar and, you know, bus driver and billionaire will be sitting side by side drinking at the bar counter. So, uh, yeah, it was completely overblown. Um, and, you know, in uh, I know friends of mine who have been Indian friends who have been treated by the same guy who was treating me very well. And I'd go ask them, you know, dude, and I could see that they were getting bullied. So I'd be like, dude, why are you bullying this guy? And they'd be like, he can't work properly. So we're bullying him, uh, you know, which is bad workplace practice but it wasn't because of racism it was because the other person couldn't work properly so there are all those issues out there remember you know if you have brown skin it's very easy to say that a white person is picking on you because of racism if you're not good at your job you'll get picked on irrespective right i think one of my earliest experiences in australia uh, when i moved from port douglas to melbourne to join university was uh, in those days, I used to have hair, so I had to go get a haircut. And I used to live in this neighborhood called Carnegie, and my barber shop was in a neighbor, uh, nearby neighborhood called Marambina. So I went to Marambina to my uh, for my haircut, and this lady, and you know, there your barber is your friend. You talk to them, you share personal gossip with them, and things like that. And she's like, Abby, you're such a nice guy. I find it really easy to talk to you. I can talk to you about anything. I'm like, uh, yeah, why? What's the problem? There's this other Indian guy who, you know, he's like really weird. He started stalking me. Uh, he's like, oh, when's your birthday? And I told him and he's like, I'll come give you a special gift. And he brought me cake and roses. And that made me feel very uncomfortable. And since then, he just keeps coming back and standing in the window staring at me. And it's like really not on. Uh, should I call the police or should I call my boyfriend to beat this fellow up? So I'm like, listen, Christy, just calm down. Let me have a chat with this guy. And she told me usually when this guy comes. So I landed, rocked up there at the same time. And I was like, dude, look, uh, you know, what the hell do you think you're trying to do? So the problem was he had seen so many Bollywood movies. He was from somewhere in Haryana. He had seen so many Bollywood movies. He thought this is how, because in Bollywood movies, this is how Western women start romances, apparently. So he thought that when the barber started talking to him, she was actually interested in him. And, you know, I had to kind of sit down and explain to him that that's not how it works. And finally, you know, that issue got resolved. But see, a culture, had she called the police or had she called her boyfriend to beat up this guy, that boyfriend beating up this guy would have gone down as a racist attack. It, it's just a cultural misunderstanding. So, you know, that that difference of cultures is so huge, it becomes very tough. 
Thank you, Abhijit. And we'll plunge into the next question. Amosh Ameria wants to know, which country should India use as a model for developing its education curriculum, police and military development policy and why? Mm. Uh, unfortunately, there's no single example of it because our size is so big, we can't use cut and paste models. You have to come up with ab initio models. Uh, one of the things you can think, I mean, this was done very early on, was the Swiss method of training goat herders and sheep herders. They just taught them what was absolutely essential, basic arithmetic and things like that. Here, what you need to do is first you need to simplify the language. See, because there, the thing was the spoken French or the spoken German, mostly it's German in Switzerland, uh, was the same as written German. You know, so there wasn't that much of a difference. Uh, the problem in India is the spoken and the written. Uh, like Shri, for example, will sometimes talk to me in Tuya Tamar, which I can't understand a single word of. I can speak Brahmana Tamar and Cheri Tamar, you know, which is, uh, you know, uh, Brahminical Tamil, which is actually not chaste at all. And uh, 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 Fisherman Tamil, which I'm very good at uh, because I used to go buy fish uh, very regularly behind my house. So, uh, yeah. So, you know, th there's... You really, there is no cut and paste model that suits India. You have to come up with ab initio solutions to uniquely Indian solutions to uniquely Indian problems. And if you want to know what Tuya Tamar is, Anda Aragiya Kurandai Aragiya Vara Parattai Virungi Aruddhadu. Now go make sense of it. Um, Abhijit, next question. I actually understood that, surprisingly. So, <laughs> don't, don't take that as an example. Normally, I don't understand Tui Tamil, but this one I understood, yeah. Satyajit Bhattacharya wants to know, Dr. Swami in NewsX mentioned you were very close to Sashikalaji in your early years and she looked after you for a while. Do you want to comment on that? It's absolutely true. You know, because uh, my mom, she was the collector of a very uh, violence-prone district. So, you know, she had to spend days away just trying to sort out riots and things like that. So, Shashikala auntie was always there at home. Shashikala auntie and Natarajan, they used to dote over me. I used to go spend uh, uh, time over at their place more often than not. And they actually looked after me very, very well. You know, Shashikala auntie used to come bring Tiffin to school and feed me and things like that. So, you know, she's she's one of the most caring human people I know. I mean, you know, I, I don't care what other people say about her. I'm only going by my experience of her. And she's a wonderful human being. And the next question is from Shashank Sharma. Is the U.S. denying raw materials for the vaccine as claimed by Mr. Poonawala? Uh, they're denying materials for the Novavax vaccine, which is the second vaccine that the Serum Institute wants to bring out. For COVID shield, no, we, we already produce everything that's required here. Thanks for that clarification. I think nobody has said that so far. Uh, no, I think is... a lot of people have. Oh, I see. The okay. problem I is it isn't amplified. You know, the, the problem is once things start, nobody listens to the clarification. Now, Dhan Singh wants to know, Abhijit, is there merit to making India a Hindu Rashtra? What are the technicalities involved in making it one? I think it already is. Go ahead. It isn't. Uh, look, my only issue with making it a Hindu Rashtra is which of the 12 schools of Hinduism is going to be the Hindu Rashtra? Okay. Right. So, for example, if you have an Islamic state, uh, Afghanistan is a Sunni Hanafi state. Turkey, even though it's secular, is technically Hanafi. Uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar are uh, officially Salafi. Iran is officially 12-er Shia. Oman is officially uh, Kharijite. So which interpretation which interpretation of Hindu Rashtra are you going to take? Okay, and what does it mean technically? See, I, I can tell you what the practicalities are if you tell me what the optimal end state is. Right? What do we accept as the common definition of Hinduism? Uh where does, you know, a religious doctrine come into the state or the state come into religious doctrine? All of things things need to be clarified. You know, everybody talks about Hindu Rashtra, but nobody wants to talk about the practicalities of Hindu Rashtra. Right. Uh, so, yeah, you, you tell me 
uh, when you ask this question again and do ask this question again, because I've always found it an interesting question, what you think the non-negotiables, the basic, the sort of lowest common denominator for a Hindu Rashtra is, and then I'll tell you how to get there. Yes, I think that's a good way to engage our audience, to make them also to think and reframe the questions. Thanks for that, Abhijit. The next question is from Arjun Sharma. Like you, I too did my schooling abroad in my early childhood. I did, in, uh, I did it in UK and felt teachers promote individualistic thinking from a young age. In India, teachers, especially language ones, felt intimidated by me because I asked a lot of questions. Was your experience similar? Uh, it depended on the school. So in Delhi, it was very similar. They'd be like, what, you think you're smarter than us, is it? <laughs> in uh, in Madras, surprisingly, it was the exact opposite. They'd be like, Abhijit, tell us, what more do you know about this and things like that? And as much as they used to engage me in class, when it came to buy marks, because abroad I used to be top of my class, in uh, India I used to be at the bottom of my class, they'd keep going to my mother and complaining, saying, this kid is so smart. Can you please tell him to write? See, we can't mark him for being smart. We can only mark him for answering the questions. And the problem is, he doesn't answer the questions. He gives us all this additional knowledge because he already knows the basics. Can you just tell him to please write the basics? <laughs> so, you know, it, it was actually a very... <laughs> Uh, uh, Madras was a very encouraging, discouraging kind of environment. I used to keep scoring the lowest in class, but they constantly used to keep telling me, you're so bright, you're so bright, uh, unlike Delhi. So, you know, it, it was a very mixed experience or Kashmir even. Kashmir was horrible, but yeah. So what was the difficulty you found in Kashmir, Abhijit? This is my question. Kashmir, the teachers were horrible. They, if you were a Hindu, it was just blatantly they hated you in your face. Uh, you, you know, all my classmates thought that they were Pakistani. Uh, so, you know, it, it uh, and, you know, in those days, the Shia Sunni divide hadn't emerged. Because remember, uh, the uh, Islamic revolution had only happened in 79. Right. And it took almost 10, 12, 15 years for that extremely virulent uh, uh, you know, chasm within Islam to become worse and worse and worse. So at that time, all of this hadn't happened. And it was very much a case of, uh, 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 you know, uh, bullying me for being a Hindu. Uh, that said, I had lots of Muslim friends who weren't like that. The problem was that, you know, uh, the worst bullies in class and the worst bullies amongst the teachers were nasty. And there's nothing your friends can do to protect you then. Yes, indeed. And let's take a uh, next question. Pramit Khatua wants to know, with the civil war-like situation um, in uh, Pakistan, what will be the repercussions on the neighbors, especially India and Afghanistan? Hmm. Nothing much. You know, the army is at the end of its tether with Imran Khan. So... Um, Look, things can't get any worse. Uh, they've done their worst in Afghanistan. They've done their worst in India. Both resilient countries. So, you know, what's the worst they can do? Have more terror attacks at best? That's it. Uh, but I think the good thing is when Pakistan is preoccupied like this, they'll be more focused internally. And so every revolution in Pakistan has a silver lining. I like that. And um, Moksha Malhotra, you had asked the same, uh, I hope you, and uh, I hope Abhijit answered your question. It was the same question. So because this person was asking me, I hope you answer my question or you ask my question. Anyway, Arvind Prakashan wants to know, what is your opinion about Yuri Bezmenov? I found his lectures interesting. Yuri Bezmenov. Yuri Bez Bezmenov. I have no Bond. idea. I have no idea. Guys. You need to See, give. I don't a... remember names. I don't remember names. You have to give me context or a face. Usually, I remember faces, but not names. And Yuri Bez Menov. Okay. Uh... Uh, no idea. I see. 
No problem. Next question, uh, Anuj Prasad. Anuj, you have four questions. I'm going to only ask one. Because today we have a lot of questions to go through and I have a hard stop at 840, uh, 9, uh, 9.45 your time. So uh, here we go. Anuj wants to know, you told in an earlier video that the head of JF-16 program told you more about IIF than any person of IIF tells what he said to you. Head of JF-17. Yes, what of it? No, what he wants to know is, is that still true? Well, yes, you know, you, you build up a relationship of trust and they tell you lots. And that mm. is true. I've actually learned more about the Indian Air Force from the Pakistan Air Force. Is it is it good, bad, ugly? How is it? <clears throat> I think they tend to overestimate themselves. What you see with the Pakistani Air Force's internal analysis of India. See, never go by their public statements. Right. Uh, right. Nothing in Pakistan works on public statements. It's all the private uh, gossip that's the most important. So what happens is, on one hand, they're extremely realistic when it comes to defending themselves. They're like, you know, there are certain things we can't do. The in, in Publicly, they'll say, you know, the JF-17 is better than the F-16. In private, they'll tell you, boss, there's no way the JF-17 is better than the F-16. We achieved what we could realistically with this plane. Uh, our thing was always a numbers game. We were going to file, a, uh, uh, you know, field uh, 200, 300 of these aircraft, as many as possible, as allowed by the budget. And in numbers, they become extremely potent, which is true. I mean, even if you take the LCA Tejas and field it in large numbers, uh, 500, 600, it will become an extremely potent plane. The problem is, does the cost benefit work out with the JF-17? It does. They're very clear about that. Uh, and on the other, there was this... I sometimes felt that they overestimated the weakness of India. They don't account for us having great pilots. They don't account for patriotism and things like that. Because, you know, these things are important in a battle. Patriotism and the training of a pilot can actually overcome some, not all, but some of the uh, uh, deficiencies of your platform. And, and viewers, we're getting a lot of questions and I'm going to request you to pause now for today's program because like I said, we're going to be winding it down in about 30 minutes from now. We can now. go on up to 10, I think. No? Okay. We can go on up to 10. Yeah. Thank you. Believe me, there's like a couple of judgments that have come down and there are a host of questions that are being lined up. So I'm going to come to you with the meat of the questions. Uh, Jay Kumar Court wants to know, in a multilingual society, what are the strengths and weaknesses? Hmm, interesting question. Uh, the weaknesses are that, you know, there's parochialism. Uh, and this isn't even something in a pre-industrial state like India. You also see this in Canada, where, you know, the uh, Quebecois seem to think that uh, the sun shines out of their ass. So uh, parochialism is very common. Uh, that's never a good thing. Uh, there's a fetishization of language. See, language is a purely purely a medium for getting instructions across and to convey meaning. It is a mode of communication. When you start fetishizing a mode of communication, uh, it's, it's, it's extremely crude. Uh, the problem, of course, is that, uh, you know, it in India, we tend to be more parochial than most other countries, except, say, Quebec. Uh, the positives are actually many. If you bring up the kids as multilingual, it rewires your brain in many different ways. We still don't understand how this works, but I think there are a lot of studies that show that kids who are brought up in multilingual uh, environments are actually, uh, uh, th their mental progress happens much quicker. They're able to, their cognitive abilities increase and things like that. The thing is, you know, we need to be very clear that this is a pure multilingual environment. They say the father only speaks Bengali or the mother only speaks Tamil. 
and you can kind of easily go between worlds. The problem that we're seeing in India, everything is getting mixed up. Bengali has become half Hindi. Hindi has become half English. Our English has become half Hindi. Uh, and that's not a healthy environment because that actually confuses. You know, kids up to seven, eight, they're actually able to compartmentalize and separate the languages very well if you teach them separately. If you start mixing everything up, it's actually counterproductive. So depending on if you do multilingual multilingualism properly, it can be a huge, huge, huge asset. If you do it badly, it can be extremely counterproductive. Um, I'm going to share one personal experience. Uh, I don't know how many of you agree with me or not. In 2015, the World Cup took place of cricket took place in Australia and ESPN had two sets of commentators, <clears throat> English and Hindi. And I used to like Karthik Murali, who was a very good commentator in both English and Hindi. I tended to follow him wherever he went. He would like switch between this and this and this and this. And, and actually I would tweet out to him, DM him and ask him, say, when are you coming on Hindi again? Because then I would switch to Hindi to listen to him speak in Hindi. I mean, I love the way, I mean, Akash Chopra is another excellent Hindi commentator. See, you need to take these programs, read, read Hindi literature if you want to really be appreciative of the beauty and nuances of the language. And I'm, this is Hindi, replace it with Bengali, Tamil, whatever. You got to read the books written by the authors. That's how you kind of keep that, uh, that uh, separation. Do not mix English into almost every language now is contaminated. I don't like that. I would like to see that pureness stay because I'll tell you, 80% of the new children that are going through schools in, in, in Tamil Nadu can't say the word Ra, the letter Ra. Ra is what is the beauty of Tamil. And they say either Tamil or they say Tamil. The La, la that also gets mixed up because the music also tends to use that. Or worse, in English news channels, they still can't pronounce Kanimori properly. They say Kanimozi. Mozi, Mozi, yeah. That is because Mozi. in you know the Ra is written as Z-H-A in Tamil, yeah. I mean in English, and they tend to literally say that. So, and, and it, it's, it's not... Like Farsi. In Farsi, the uh, most fun word is Aka. Hmm. And, you know, it's Aka in Hindi or in Hindi Urdu movies. They say, Aka, aapne ye kya kar diya? But, see, nobody gets the ha ka properly. It's Aka. Uh, it, it's very tough. <laughs> it's very tough. To, it's just one of those things, but it's great fun. Yes. So I, yeah. I, I, I encourage children, especially at a younger age, to learn as many languages as possible. Your brain has the capacity to deal with this. Don't think that you have to learn one, you're giving up on something else. Make it fun. Listen to your neighbor, what language they're speaking. Try to reply back to them in their language. You'll make their day. And, and you want an extra sweet that will come to you every time. You have to make that extra effort though, like Abhijit used to do. Anyway, um, next question is from Tutul. Have, how and in what way uh, would... Um, Tutul, can you please rephrase your question? You have you're done it typing on your phone and there are too many short forms that I can't make sense of. Don't want to make a wrong question here. Please resend your question. It is T-U-T-U-L. I don't know what that means. Next question. Ishant Mida wants to know, is India submarine program going in the right direction? What is the capability of Scorpion class subs and our nuclear submarines? And should India procure more Scorpion class submarine? You know, the submarine program is one of the bright sparks. Uh, the nuclear program is going very well. That's the domestic program. The only problem with it is because Russia helped us with the construction, it's a uh, multi-hull uh, submarine. And, you know, I think we discussed this in the last yes, AMA on the advantages of uh, Western single-hull designs versus uh, Russian and Chinese multi-hull designs, especially, you know, the acoustic uh, baggage of having a multi-hull design and, you know, the havoc it wreaks with signal processing, with uh, uh, sonar signal processing and things like that. 
So uh, uh, the thing is, everything else in the program is going just fine, but we need to settle on a single hull design. And you can only do that if you build not six scorpions, but, you know, 20, 30 scorpions where you understand how to fabricate a single hull. You create enough human capital here you create at least three four teams that learn how to weld and fabricate a single hull and you know that hull fabrication itself is extremely complicated it's laser fabrication where you know you weld it from inside without actually looking at it so there's all kinds of things involved we actually got that technology with the type 1500 and the problem was because you know that got bogged down in controversy and all of that we lost all the human skills we had gained. And, you know, we keep constantly underestimating the human aspect to this. Because, you know, skills gained are so important. Why did Germany and Japan rebuild so fast after the war? Right? It's because the humans were already trained. All you had to do was introduce capital and peace into the situation. And it, the, it's humans who build economies. Economies don't build themselves, right? It's like that. Uh, 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 building of submarines is done by human beings. You have to invest in human beings and you have to have a long enough production run to create the economies of scale in India, to create the skills in India for it to, you know. Uh, uh, so you don't need another submarine. What you need is about your entire, uh, this thing should be based on the scorpion. And then from all the skills you've learned, start applying the single hull uh, skills to your next nuclear submarine. Um, last question, just to round out the topic about submarines, what is the primary mode of engagement of a submarine? Is it to gather intelligence or to be in participating in active warfare? So these days it's primarily to gather intelligence. They're fantastic at it, you know, because they can just, I mean, they're, they're literally like the assassin, you know, medieval assassin going undetected any you can literally uh, this used to happen during the cold war that you know american submarines literally used to go to the mouth of russian rivers inside their territorial waters and just sit at the bottom of the ocean uh, i'm sure it's still done it's just that we don't talk about these things publicly uh, so primarily it's intelligence gathering but see that intelligence gathering just makes the submarine more potent because what you're doing is you're gauging from the noise, you can tell which boat is what. You're creating intelligence databases. And then what happens is, you know, when, uh, uh, say, war breaks out and you've got to choke the Malacca Straits, you can match that acoustic signature that you've built up of every single ship that has gone into or come out of a Chinese harbor. And what you do is you note down the time that you heard these signatures, you create the acoustic database, then you match it with uh, uh, satellite imagery. This is if you're in full stealth mode and you don't surface and put out your periscope to see which ship it is. Uh, you match the two and you say, see, this was a destroyer. This was one of their submarines. This was this, this was that. And, you know, you can pinpoint them during a time of war. So people say, you know, it's very difficult to pinpoint the Malacca Straits because they're so busy. With modern acoustic technology, it really isn't all that difficult. And um, uh, last question, uh, again, sorry, this is re related to um, submarines and ships. Indian Navy, did Indian Navy not blockade the port of Karachi in 1971? Completely blockade them? Yeah, and attacked them too. We set all the oil installations on fire. Yeah, so I think that was one of those points where I think Pakistan really lost the nerve when they saw that you know, one of the biggest cities. I think at that point, Karachi was the biggest city, just completely yes. rendered ineffective, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it has its uses. Please continue. If you want to say something more, I'll, I'll pull up the next question. Okay. Biswajit Mukherjee wants to know, what's your thought on the recent violence in the West Bengal election? Has the state gone to dogs? Your state, man. I know my state. Um, look, it was always violent, boss. Tell me what is new about the violence here. This is actually baby violence compared to what we've seen uh, uh, every, every single year. Tell me one election in Bengal that has not been murderously violent. Uh, if you remember the election that brought Mamta Banerjee to power, 
the the kind of murders you were seeing on both side were like next level so it's okay it's it's part of what bengal does you know the thing is we do a very good job of using robindra shongit and the image of bhadralok to cover up how violent we are <laughs> so are you do you consider yourself a member of those two clubs yeah of course <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm extreme bhadra look. <laughs> Chaitanya wants to know is China trying to create a Himalayan quad with Afghanistan, Pakistan and Nepal. Huh? <laughs> we don't think so. <laughs> Sorry Chaitanya, I don't think that's going to happen. I mean there is you got to have no. some power on the other people's hands. in order to make an effective quad that's essentially china nothing else ab uh, sudindra wants to know ss menon i think he means shiv shankar menon said that indian leadership not naming china is due to reciprocity instead of lack of will as they too have not named china what's your view on this i think they too have not named Who india hasn't named i uh, what he is trying to say is there is a reciprocal measure india doesn't name china in their statement and china doesn't name india is it true that is simply not true that is simply not true that is simply not true china names india very pointedly so i think what ss menon is saying is then is not correct then yeah it isn't see china names us when they feel the need to name us i mean you show me it's one thing saying ss menon said this but you show me one statement about india where they don't actually name india by name so you mean china okay i get it shashank sharma wants to know allahabad high court passed an order for lockdown in few districts of up and not the government is this not judicial overreach mm -hmm. yes it's very dangerous right the thing is however when does judicial overreach happen when the government doesn't act or the government is too scared to act or the judiciary thinks they can get away with trampling on the government all of these are extremely dangerous because they uh, basically they mean governmental failure or the failure of checks and balances and up isn't a super spreader state at the moment the big super spreader at the moment is maharashtra maharashtra accounts for 30% of all uh 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 covid cases in india at the moment and remember the high court didn't feel the need to get into this yes yes so that tech uh anish sharma wants to know china invested in sports to make their people more competitive and confident what approach can we take because our people are more moronic and only seek to feel good emotions anish sharma anish you know uh, i don't don't generalize uh nay nee, what was the first part of the question that china promotes sports so that people can feel more confident it's like soft power sports development you know like for mm, example uh, olympics that's, that's if, not that's not entirely true you know china is actually more of a good news society than india in india because we're democratic you know you hear a lot of bad news as well in china if you're in china itself uh, it's a full on good news society they simply won't allow bad news to filter through so uh not true i think the only good news society that i know where editors and co proactively try to put good news on the front page would be israel except for haritz but then you know haritz like every other left wing schmuck uh, loves celebrating misery <laughs> um arun gupta wants to know hey abhijit what do you think about the prince of jordan who was put under house arrest is there a coup by the army no no not a coup by the army but see what happens here is that uh, in jordan uh you you've seen several ups and downs right because uh uh, uh the, the former crown prince before uh, 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 uh who was uh, king hussein's brother uh, he was removed the uh, just 5 days before uh, king hussein died 
and uh, that king abdullah hussein's son was made the king so this kind of intra palace intrigue happens a lot hamza's case was that he was uh, you know pretty close to both the israelis and the saudis so it's one of those things where you know jordan has basically because of all these peace agreements jordan has become completely irrelevant and they would have felt that you know hamza's uh, uh a role uh going between saudi arabia and uh, israel was threatening the uh, uh was threatening the king that would have been it uh that that's the speculation uh on the inside but that's about it but no not a military coup um pranav thete wants to know can you suggest a book on industrialization and economy uh no uh because you know the problem with these things is there's nothing macro written about these you have to read a lot of you have to sort of connect the dots uh but let me check uh, uh shri if you remind me on whatsapp i will find i will uh, i have read a single macro book on this but i will definitely try and find something for you got it got it next question do you think from banu prasad do you think buddhists are better intellectual kshatriyas than hindus with respect to how china and burma have handled uh, uh, uh how burma has handled china better than india no not really uh laos is equally buddhist and they haven't handled the chinese very well uh cambodia hasn't handled the chinese very well uh so no uh, uh you know uh, and that particular form of theravada buddhism is in burma and sri lanka sri lanka hasn't handled china very well so you know it's just burma is burmese and the burmese have handled the chinese very well that's about it nothing to do with buddhism here uh next question is from mr lee abhijit could you explain how the israeli sabotage iran's nuclear infrastructure yet again we honestly don't know because there are so many tools to be used out here uh the thing is all reactors and their ancillary mechanisms will have an air gap which is to say none of the computers there will be linked to any outside computers so at some point they clearly found some vulnerability somewhere where usb stick like you know stuxnet was introduced through a usb stick and it actually affected more machine parts in india than it did in iran uh because the same russian contractor who was building a nuclear reactor in iran was also doing some nuclear work here and uh that particular virus worked on the siemens thing this was a case of overloading the uh, uh electricity generation circuit so the problem is because the details are so scant we don't know what was overloaded what the chipset uh, th- that was attacked was or what what was the machine that was attacked was the one thing we do know is that whatever it was had to be physically introduced so it had to be some kind of sd card or usb stick there's a name now being mentioned i think iran has named a a person and he's actually gone missing it has to be that there, there, there is always a human link you have to especially after what happened with stuxnet the iranians have become so paranoid about maintaining the air gap the flaw comes about because of you know you can never guarantee that all your people will be 100% loyal to you and in fact they can be 100% loyal to you and all the enemy needs is one moment of weakness you gave your work computer to your daughter who then went on to netflix or you gave it to your son who went on to some porn website and khalas that's it because they would have kept watching you kept watching you kept watching you the moment you linked up your work computer to your home wifi network or your son connected it to the porn network or whatever finished 
so we still don't know in what way this particular bug was introduced but clearly it was and it had to be a human introduction and uh, this happens more often than you think. And if you want a flavor for this, there is a show called Tehran. You can take a look at it to at least get a feel for all the different dissensions there. Who is the who is opposing the current regime? Who is for it? And so on. It, it gives you some flavor about that. Um, Shailesh Latkar wants to know, you said China is building up close to our borders. What is their objective? Would they want to and will they be able to cut off chicken's neck? Uh, no, uh, they can't really cut off chicken's neck because understand as much of a logistical nightmare as it is for us, it's also a logistical nightmare for them, right? And we have the advantage that like we discussed in the last program, all our fighters operate from the planes and therefore even the same fighters, Sukhoi versus Sukhoi, our Sukhois have a significant advantage over their Sukhois uh, because their Sukhois and especially in that particular area, if you look at it, the chi near the chicken's neck, their air bases are at an altitude of around 11, 12,000 feet. It gets a bit worse in that side. It kind of subsides and then it gets, uh, uh, because see, that's pretty close to that, uh, you know, the Everest zone, the Everest massive zone. So it actually gets higher. The plateau gets somewhat higher there. The air bases are higher. And then when you go towards the end of Arunachal, it comes down to about 9,000 feet. Uh, even those 3,000 feet make a big difference, by the way. Huh? But uh, no, they, it's not that easy for them to cut out. And remember the infrastructure I spoke about, that they're still building it within about 100 to 150 kilometers inside China proper. Next question is from Shailesh Latkar. You said once that Tejas is not a good fighter, but if he bought it in large numbers, it would make sense and possibly get better. How does that work? Mm, very simple because you're committed to a program you have no way of backing out it's you know it's your back to the wall that's when you produce the best results number one number two if you start producing in quantity things automatically start getting better your production processes start getting better and things like that if you produce in large quantity and you know it comes down all the german tanks the fighters the tanks the ships the submarines were better than the russian ships tanks submarines and yet the russians won and, you know, this is called the Stalin dictum, that quantity has a quality all of its own. That's a good way to put it. Um, Tutul has refined his question and come back. How and in what way, Abhijit, sir, would you recommend fighting toxic feminists who are screwing men like heck? And what's the best possible way to take back POK? <laughs> By the way, did you just presume my gender and call me sir? Did you even ask me my pronouns? How do you know I self-identify as a man? But <laughs> well, anyway, he, okay. Yeah. Now. Uh, toxic feminists. What do you do with toxic feminists? There's nothing you can do, boss. There's literally nothing you can do. You know, I mean, I grew up in an age where feminists were, they were fighting real battles. Today, these people are just sitting around and making excuses for the fact that they don't get employed by claiming there's some systemic discrimination against them or whatever crap. No, there isn't. You know, there was. I grew up in the 80s and 90s when there was real systemic discrimination against women. So, you know, this is... You know, they say there's... Okay, this is the Abhijit dictum. There is nothing worse than the wrath of a third rater with the mirror held up to their face. And that's what you're seeing. It's a psychological problem. There's nothing you can do. And his other question is, how easy would it, how would you retake POK? I would not. I think we've discussed this before. I don't even want to talk about retaking POK. <laughs> I think Maybe we both... If and after Pakistan collapses, we can have this chat. I'm not going to do anything about it. Did you see the um, PLT leader being handled in the prison? There's some video going down. They're really beating him up. Did you see that? No. Okay. Uh, Ojas Chowdhury wants to know, what is the quality of our battleships, destroyers and frigates? Very mixed, very, very mixed. Uh, you know, you can't, 
a serious country with a serious problem like India, with a serious security problem like India, should be like America, consolidate on one kind of battleship, consolidate the same weapon, the same engine, the same radar across your entire fleet. Instead, we do what, you know, uh, Sweden or France do, who don't have a real enemy near them, or at least an enemy that's going to attack them. So, you know, they keep producing three ships of one kind and then move on to a new set of ships, new equipment, new everything. You can't afford to do that, boss. And see, in their case, it even makes economic sense because, you know, they need to keep giving a, a flip up to their industry uh, because their industry keeps producing new radars, new this, new that. So it makes sense for them. For us, you haven't even indigenized the stuff first. So how are you going to sit and keep producing only three ships of a class, three ships of a class, every class changes after that. You come to a finite model, you make it future proof. And then, like I said, you know, with the Scorpions, you need to build 24 of the Scorpions. You build 24 of that same class of ship. And the second thing, very important that you have to solve is this systems integration problem between Western uh, weapon systems and uh, Eastern sensors and Eastern weapon systems on the same boat. It's very, very problematic. And Abhijit, I think you meant Philip, F-I-L-L-I-P instead of flip, F-L-I-P. I could be wrong. Eh? What? Philip? To give a fill up, Philip to the local industry. Oh, yeah, to, yeah, yeah, to, to give a Philip to the local industry. Philip. I, I, it came across as flip. Ah. No, you didn't flip the book. <laughs> So Chaitanya wants to know, how did Burma handle China? I mean, sure, they have been handling them well. What exactly is the they, accomplishment? They didn't handle China. They keep handling China. It's an ongoing process. And what they do is, first, they very coyly settled the Makman line with China. You know, the Makman line that was drawn, uh, 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 extended to Burma. Right. And... The Burmese very early on said, okay, tell us your interpretation of it. Uh, let's come to a, a settlement. And they sorted it out. As opposed to Nehru, who went on playing ostrich, saying, you know, no, 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 our claims are the only one. We don't want to hear your claims. That's the end of it. Karke. They didn't do that. They settled it, number one. Because, you know, Shan state is a Chinese majority state in Burma, as in a Chinese ethnic majority in Burma. Uh, the next thing that they did was they'd keep giving socks to the Chinese. Come build this, come build that. And then when it suits them, if China got too smart by half or if they felt threatened, they'd just keep the Chinese out. At the same time, they were always consistently and virulently opposed to the West. So China was always worried that, you know, if you push Burma too much, they'll go lock, stock and barrel into the Western fold. So it was a lot of things. It was also circumstance, but it was sheer skill. Because, you know, with, in the circumstances that Burma is, it still requires a lot of skill to be able to navigate that. Yes, thank you very much. And the next question is from Raj. Should India look at the USA's A-10 Warthog to tackle Chinese artillery and has low operating costs? A-10 No, not Warthog. really. Who told you it has low operating costs, boss? Low, low, low. I know. Who told you it has low operating costs? It does not actually have low operating costs. The older the platform, the more it costs. For example, the Maruti 800 that you bought in 1980, if you're running it now, everything is going to start breaking down. The costs actually go up. Okay, the second thing is the A-10 was very useful. Remember, the A-10 was developed when precision weapons hadn't come, uh, hadn't matured. Today, when they're matured, for you to have, you know, the entire plane, it's not a plane that was designed and a gun fitted onto it. The plane was designed around the gun. One third of the plane's body is taken up by the gun. So, you know, today, when you have a merge happening between Indians and Chinese or Indians and Pakistanis, for a plane to be coming down and using its cannon to strafe, you'll end up causing severe blue and blue casualties. That's not the way it works. That is why you now have precision guided weapons. You actually don't need the A-10 right now. Had you told me this about, you know, uh, 20, 30 years back, I would have said, yeah, absolutely go for the A-10. 
uh, Turkey went for the A10 when you know the cost of uh, 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 um, uh, I don't know if it finally got cascaded to Turkey, but I think Turkey did get some of the A10s when you know uh, after 1991 the uh, Gulf storm when you know the cost of precision weapons was exorbitant today precision weapons aren't that exorbitant it's cheaper for you for a plane to use a precision weapon that costs say one million dollars to take out a tank that costs three to four million dollars than it is putting a 20 million dollar plane at risk and its pilot who has taken years and years and millions to train at risk by bringing him and the plane down at low altitude just for the pleasure of some World War II style strafing of a tank. It's pure opportunity cost. So in this day and age, it does not make sense. No. Next question is from Shailesh Latkar. Should India now set up a cyber defense force directly under the PMO after the power supply to Mumbai was hacked by the Chinese? Yes, yes, yes. The problem is where are you even going to start training them, boss? Capacity to tumhari hai nahi. Shuru karo, shuru karo. Ab shuru karne se 10-15 saal mein kuch hoga. But you know, for that, you first have to be a society that accepts its own failings. And you know what happens to me. The moment I point out failings, Ganje, Takle, Homo, Haramzade, those are the kind of abuses I get. So, you know, if you're a good news society, you live in a placebo. Enjoy. And viewers, I hope you are all uh, subscribing to our channel because I believe that some of the information dispensed here is very unique and it's very to the point and very current. And uh, please help us by joining our membership as well as subscribing to our channel. We have about 10 minutes left in our program today. Can I speak a bit more detail to that previous answer? Please go ahead. See, there's two parts to cyber defense. One is... Uh, uh, the actual setting up of the cyber defense force. But the second is trust in your government, that the government will not abuse or misuse that information against you because very frequently when companies get attacked, they suppress the information. Because in our judicial system, you will get scapegoated. Uh, and, uh, you know, there'll be massive negative publicity and things like that. Whereas, say, in France, the way they do it, or the way in America they do it, is companies come quietly and tell the government this is what happened. The government carries out the forensics. They immediately tell other companies without mentioning the company that this happened to. This was a uh, something that we saw. This is a vulnerability. Fix it immediately. And then you additionally have a cyber defense core that looks after things. So remember, cyber defense is a system of systems, whole of government thing. It's not just, you know, boys and girls sitting in a room, typing away at a computer like you see in, you know, uh, Dr. Strange Love kind of movies. Right. Those days are long gone, of course. Of course. Yeah. Next question. Uh, Mr. Lee wants to know, do you see the possibility of a national health emergency in India? If COVID-19 yes. stress increases. Yes. I think at least till, uh, what, uh, till mid-May to early June, you will see an emergency. It will even out by mid-May to early June, but till then, yes. And um, I think I, I see the, 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 the winds blowing in that direction. Ishank Sagar wants to know, why Indian armed forces like a small kid constantly pleading daddy Indian government to buy multiple models of all kinds of weapons. From where had this foolishness crept in? It's, it's 70s thinking. You wanted different models for different uh, uh, jobs. And also you wanted multiple suppliers for the same model because you never know when you were going to get sanctioned. So if you bought, say, a 130 mm gun, and you know, 130 mm gun was, became famous at uh, the siege of Dien Bien Phu, uh, you wanted 130 mm guns from France, you wanted 130 mm guns from Russia, and you wanted 130 mm guns from America. Why? Because you never know when one would sanction you. And that, unfortunately, has become ingrained in the system. So hedging your bets is now taken on a new meaning of its own. Yes. 
Debashish Chatterjee wants to know, has the government reissued contracts for the howitzer guns to Indian companies after con cancelling the Israeli contract? No. The next question is from T-H-I-E Devil, The Devil. <laughs> Do you think China is testing waters with coronavirus as a bio-war weapon to see how world reacts. I wouldn't be surprised, huh? I really wouldn't be surprised. I personally think that, you know, uh, knowing what little I do of the Chinese, uh, do I think the outbreak was accidental? Yes. But do I think China used the opportunity to learn how to play divide and rule and how to exploit the situation? Yes. Trust me, they've made notes. Uh, even if they didn't deliberately unleash it, they've definitely made notes and learned how to weaponize this later on. As in weaponize an outbreak, not weaponize this particular strain, but weaponize a future outbreak. And last two questions. Crypto Gyan wants to know, Abhijit, I have seen Vokari creeping into SaaS Bahu shows also. It is because white knighting is in our blood. Bad discriminatory laws against men. How to cope? Create a, you know, a men's vote bank. You know, uh, because uh, I know MGR used to do that, uh, created a women's vote bank called Thai Kulam. Yeah, you know, Thai meaning mother, Kulam meaning clan. So the mother clan, uh, you know, uh, uh, create the Appa Kulam or something like that. You know, cre create a men's party or something like that. Pressure group. And last question for today. Ajay Nair wants to know, why are we not setting up uh, something? Funny. Quickly, quickly, one sec. Just to link this to a previous question that was asked about judicial activism, yeah. do you know it's actually the judiciary that is tampering down the anti-male bias in these anti-male laws that have been introduced? So, you know, for example, take a woman at face value, no need for proof, through judicial uh, uh, intervention, that has actually now reduced. You actually have to prove uh, it, it's not a, uh, it's not a presumption of guilt automatically. They give bail and things like that very easily. So, you know, this is one of the things where the judiciary is actually acted to control the excessive impulses of uh, the legislature. And see, this is the real problem with India. That on one hand, you can say judicial activism is bad. On the other, the judiciary has actually done a wonderful thing in tempering down this sort of legislative activism sorry next ajay nair wants to know why are we not setting up something like a darpa and pentagon how long will we run ministry of defense like this was drdo was meant to be your darpa no so as long as the socialist mindset continues see for me drdo should be what it should be a, a four or five year paid vacation to the scientist any scientist who has proven, he, should, he needs to come. They, they all need to be working in the private sector and they need to come and say, you know, uh, uh, the owner, the malik of that factory needs to come and say, this scientist has proven himself extraordinary. Uh, I recommend him for DRDO membership. In DRDO, they're given a blank slate saying, use your creativity, develop what you want. That patent will belong 33%, 33%, 33%. Uh, say maybe... Uh, 10, 45, 45%. 10% 45 royalties will belong to you. 45% will belong to the government. 45% will belong to the factory owner who recommended you. Uh, that kind of thing where, you know, you do pure cutting edge research based on deliverables. But you don't want to do that. So enjoy yourself. So that brings us to a close of today's Ask Abhijit program. Thank you, Abhijit, for extending it by 15 minutes. I know you had a hard uh, deadline. And Namaskar, do subscribe to our channel. Please join and consider joining our membership program. And some of those questions that we could not take, I apologize. We just ran out of time. But 
please remember them and ask them again in the next episode and we'll be sure to mention that thank you abhijit once again namaskar veer veer vetri veel and vetri veel veer veel